series on divorce, and this time we have Desertion by Christian Spouses, Part 2. Part 2. You know the text that we've been dealing with. The Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 12, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she is pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. God, we do pray that you bless the preaching, teaching tonight. We thank you for midweek service. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us all that we need that pertains unto life, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, that we might be perfect, truly furnished. Now keep us from error, Lord, not to add to or take away from your word. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Now last week we took some time and we examined some ways that Paul's apparent second cause of a just divorce could be reconciled with the Lord's apparent single cause, what we call the exception clause that he gave in Matthew in regard to fornication being an exception for divorce. Uh, we noted that some ways you could reconcile Paul with the Lord in the Gospels is that it's further revelation. What the epistles do is build upon the Gospels, just as the Gospels build, built upon the Old Testament. And uh, he's not contradicting the Lord. He's just given details that the Lord did not mention. The Lord gave the principles, the foundation, and Paul built upon them. We also notice that when you look at the biblical law in the Old Testament, there are times when there is a case, this is how God legislates this thing, where you have suppositionary, circumstantial evidence of appearance, and you are allowed to act upon that without absolute evidence. He gave us this example in regard to the sixth commandment. You're not to kill. But if somebody's breaking into your house at night, you are allowed to kill them basically on suppositionary circumstantial evidence. If you don't want to die as a murderer, don't do what murderers do and break into somebody's house at night. Now, likewise, in regard to the seventh commandment, in regard to adultery, which we're dealing with here, a woman, the law, states clearly that if she's in the city and somebody is trying to rape her, she is to scream. She is to scream. And um, if there was no scream, and there were people that could have heard, then based upon that suppositionary circumstantial evidence, then it, she was to be tried as an adulteress, according to the Bible. Now, you might not like that law, but God gives you these cases in the Old Testament. So likewise, we pointed out, not to get further into it, you can listen to last week's message again, if you, or if you haven't heard it. Uh, the point is, is if you desert your spouse, somebody doesn't have to follow you around with a private eye or something here. Um, if you're not coming home, if, if you reject all attempts to bring you home, if you reject the church's... Um, government, if you continue to be a willful deserter, then you have the appearance as an adulteress. You are covenant breaking, but that's one way to reconcile these things. Um, we also looked at the fact that one of the major purposes of marriage is to have this practical dwelling with one another and to avoid fornication and and other reasons. And uh, if somebody is living in a practically unmarried state, they are divert they have deserted 
their partner and they are not fulfilling one of the chief purposes of marriage. They're practically living as if they are unmarried. Certainly you can't just desert the house, desert your spouse. Um, Leah and Jacob were living together, but um, they were not dwelling together in the married state, see, even though legally they were married. Um, finally, we looked at provoking the other spouse to adultery is against the spirit of the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery certainly means don't provoke other people to do the sins that God tells you not to do. You're not to participate in the sin in any way. You're not to fund it. You're not to finance it. You're not to tempt people to do these sins. Um, and the Lord even says that somebody that puts away their spouse in an unlawful way causes them to commit adultery. That doesn't mean they go and commit adultery. It doesn't mean they have to commit adultery. But you're never to put a temptation on anybody. You're not to provoke somebody to sin in a secondary sense. Now, let's restate some crucial things for clarification. It's important to remember that the scriptures do not say this. They do not say, if your husband or wife is an unbeliever, leave them. Is that what it said? That's not what it says. That's not what it says at all. It says that you should. It doesn't even say that. It says that if they leave you, you're free. That's what that says. The teaching is if they depart, if they are not pleased to dwell with you. And this is important because Paul's saying, why, why would you try to make them leave? Why would you leave your marriage? That's, that's not. He gives one argument that how do you know you're not going to save the other spouse? You say they're an unbeliever. Well, how do you know by being with you they're not going to become a believer? Peter makes somewhat of the same argument, but he never clarifies what type of disobedient person he's talking about. Whether he's talking about a disobedient unbeliever, disobedient to the gospel, or a disobedient Christian. I don't think his words matter. I mean, I don't think that matters in regard to his words. He's already given this whole epistle just about dealing with all these different things that you can encounter in life. And he's saying just, if you suffer through these things for Christ's sake, God's going to bless you. So he says, likewise, giving you another example. Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, see, he never clarifies whether you're talking about an unbeliever or a believer who's disobedient. I believe it applies to both. If you have a husband that's not obedient to the word of God, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That means by your lifestyle. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And this has happened all throughout history. I could give you a list of great Christians that were not very good people before they got saved. And they'll say, we got saved because of a godly woman. You know, a godly woman got saved and she led me to the Lord. I mean, that's, that's what they say. So... It might not happen instantly, but Peter says this can happen. And there's a greater chance of that happening without being yelled at and contentious strife in the home. Now, there's a line where the believer is not to compromise to win the disobedience, to win the sinner. But God does reward those who suffer to do God's will and to win people. But if the spouse will not dwell with you, if this spouse departs, if they leave the believing spouse, the innocent spouse who's trying to make the marriage work, the innocent spouse is not in bondage. Now in the case of two professing believers, two people who claim they're believers, the command is not to depart or divorce on either side. Don't you leave your husband? Don't you leave your wife? Don't divorce? If one does depart, 
Paul says you better not commit adultery when you leave. You're already in sin. You're already a covenant breaker. You better not add adultery to that covenant breaking. There's a time window, I believe implied, where you need to return back to your spouse or husband. And the innocent spouse should try to use all means of the church, prayer, urging, to try to bring that marriage back together. See, because the, the spouse who's breaking covenant has already committed a sin unto death. They can be greatly judged in this life and at the judgment seat of Christ if they don't repent in time before the Lord comes or before they die. So what happens if you use every means available to try to get the, innocent, uh, the guilty spouse to return back to the marriage, the professing believer? What happens if you've done everything you can? Well, judgment is upon the head of that person. They first go under church discipline. It says, Matthew 18, if he shall neglect to hear them, you send people, you send witnesses, you try to persuade them to do the right thing, go back to your wife, go back to your husband. Then you tell them to do the church. It becomes a church matter. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now listen to this. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That means whatever you have excluded from your church will be ratified by God. Unless that church made some major mistake, the general principle here is God honors the government that He instituted, you see, in its just exercise of that government. Very, very dangerous to disobey parents, to disobey church government, to disobey any government that the Lord, but the Bible said in the last days that they will despise government. So the church is to exclude this professing believer, and the church is in one sense to treat them like they would a heathen, like they would a publican. Now, a publican was a tax collector in, the back, in those days, and it was a very evil person. It was a compromiser to the Roman government. And they lied, they falsely accused. It was one of the worst people that you could imagine. Zacchaeus was one of those, and he got saved. And not only got saved, I, I meant he, he had a full repentance and made restitution for his sin, saying, whatever I've stolen, I'm going to pay extra. So there's a sense in which you are to treat them as an unbeliever. Why? Hopefully, by the church excluding them, they will come to repentance and not have to have God exclude them from the kingdom church that will be in the millennium. See? Meaning that there's going to come a time if they don't repent, God says, well, whoever's excluded from the local church they're going to be excluded from the millennial kingdom. Not from eternity, but from the millennial promises of reward. Listen to what he says. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, I don't got to worry about that, he sh and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, they, they leave their spouse, they go start drinking, they start hanging out with the bad crowd, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall appoint him, I'm sorry, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. In other words, in one sense, for a time period, they get what the hypocrites get. I used to preach downtown many, many, many years ago in Texas, in Dallas, in I'd hand out tracts saying, I hope you're getting along with your friends right now. 
because you're going to be spending some time with them. You like your bar friends? You like this bar crowd? You like these unbelievers? Because you're going to spend some time with them if you're a believer at the judgment seat of Christ and during the millennial kingdom. And boy, that, that, that caused a lot of people to say, whoa, wait a second. I'm hanging out with this crowd now. I'm not going to be hanging out with this crowd then. What are you talking about? I know I'm once saved, always saved, bought by the blood. I'm a believer. Well, you didn't hear the rest of the story. You didn't hear about the judgment seat of Christ. You didn't hear about the millennial kingdom. Somebody left out the millennial kingdom 1,000 years before eternity. You've got a, an anemic theology here. How could you miss this on all these different pages of the Bible? Luke doesn't call it a hypocrite. The, Luke says, The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. And it doesn't say he's not a true servant. It says he's a disobedient servant. He will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. He uses the word unbeliever. It's clear. There's a sense in which the church is to treat you as an unbeliever if you will not hear the government of the church. And the Lord says, whatsoever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. That means by God's government in the coming millennial kingdom. Ephesians says, let no man deceive you with vain words. They tell you you don't have to worry about things. Oh, this isn't sin. You don't got to worry about anything. Oh, you're a believer. You can't be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. There's no terror of the Lord for you. You can sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth. You don't got to worry about this. Hey, I don't believe you lose eternal salvation. I don't believe in some corrupt, wicked perversion of God's judgment seat of Christ, which is a Catholic purgatory. But I believe in the judgment seat of Christ. But hardly, or put it this way, very few public theologians believe in that today. And that's why you have so many people willing to leave their marriages. So many people willing to eat and drink with the drunken. So many people willing to live in sin because nobody's given them warnings. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't be a partaker now where you get cast out of the church and excluded. And God forbid, if that's happened unto you, repent. You say, well, I can't go back to your husband or to your wife. Hey, how about I'm sorry? How about everybody that's been affected by your wickedness, you get on your face and apologize? How about you make restitution for what you have done and tell God you're sorry and for the rest of your life try to fix and undo the wickedness that you have done? I didn't even know these things, but when I got saved, I went knocking on doors. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nobody had to tell me to make restitution. Some things I couldn't make restitution for. But you ought to try, amen? Try to do everything in your power to fix what you've broken. That's true repentance. And can you imagine being hardened and believing vain words? So you either die or the Lord comes and He ratifies your excluded state. Oh, you could find some wicked church somewhere, some big giant rock and roll church somewhere, and they'll receive you. God's not looking at that mess. God, God, God doesn't honor that mess. God says you better go get right with the church that excluded you. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, that's on the foundation of Christ, the foundation of your salvation, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work, that's everything he's done in his life, shall be burned, that means unaccepted by God, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Don't play around with these words. The early Christians didn't play around with these words. Many of great... Christian men and missionaries down through the ages didn't play around with these words. G.H. Pember, Watchman Nee, I mean, all down through the ages. But nowadays, the Bible said in the last days, there'll be no fear of God. They won't endure sound doctrine. They'll despise government. 
They'll feed themselves without fear. So now, they don't take these words. But, but one thing this does show you is there can be an unfruitful Christian. There can be a believer that has no works at the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing acceptable to God, that is. And they're going to suffer. Yet so is by fire. That's during the millennial kingdom. Oh, praise God. I tell you what, uh, let's not be high-minded either. You know what happens to a lot of people? They say, hey, I've got my marriage. It's all together. Things are going great in my house. Children going well. Things are going great. Praise God. You need to be praised. Stick together. Stay married. Keep trying to teach your kids to do right. But don't be high-minded. Don't be high-minded. Be careful. Be careful. You can easily fall. And then you're going to find out how much grace God had given you. How much grace God has given you in your life. See, people can go crazy. People can lose their mind. All kinds of things can happen. People can decide to go serve the devil. You better be careful that you don't get high-minded and over-congratulate yourself about these things. See, You need to say, I'm going to try to follow God's promises, and I'm going to keep trying to do good and have a reasonable estimation of what you've done, but also get on your face and say, God, thank you for the grace of God. Thank you. Because a lot of it's grace. Really, in one sense, it's all grace, but you know what I'm saying. We have free will, we have responsibility, but some things are outside of your control. And a lot of times when a person experiences this, they're a different person. They talk different, they act different, and, and see, they're not as high-minded as they were, not as judgmental as they were about things. Um, this is a toxic age. Physical toxicity, mental propaganda, toxicity. It's a dangerous age. It's easy to go wrong in this day and age. God forbid it happens to you. There are two doctrines that are in opposition, and both of them are wrong. They say there's no such thing as an unfruitful Christian because the Arminian says there can be an unfruitful Christian, but they say they lose their salvation, see. Their hyper-Calvinist says if anybody doesn't obey God, to a certain degree, they never tell you what that line is, uh, but they say, well, they're not a real Christian. They were fake the whole time. So really, what's going to happen here, if somebody disobeys the church and is a covenant breaker, leaves their spouse, the Arminian would say, you just lost your salvation. There's all kinds of churches that believe you lose salvation, especially here in the Ozarks. Free Will Baptist, General Baptist, Pentecostals, uh, Assembly of God. I mean, I can just go on and on and on and on and on. Then there is the Reformed Puritan idea uh, of some, hyper-Calvinist we call it, that says it's the way of the masters type of thing. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the only real believer is a sold-out disciple who's continually bringing forth fruit, or he's not really saved. Now, there's a lot of people that really aren't saved. They are professing believers that don't know anything about the gospel. And a lot of these fellows might even say, you have to really believe, and they have a work salvation. But they do not believe that there can be a Christian that all his works burn up and he's still saved. But really, you end up in almost the same place. Because they're going to say, well, I'm going to tell you, if that woman won't go back to her husband, and she's going to break covenant, which is sin unto death in Romans 1, and she's going to reject the authority of the church, how can she be a real believer? She's only a pretend believer. She's not a real believer. And they may be right, but not necessarily. Somebody can walk as men and be unfruitful, and they're, they're saved in eternity, but they're walking like an unbeliever in this life. That's clear. But there's different ways to believe, different things to believe, different degrees of unbelief. He says to Thomas and John, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Of 
according to the Lord Jesus, a disciple can be faithless. I believe Thomas believed the gospel, but he was sure confused about a lot of things. The Bible said in the last days, they'll fall away into another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. If you fall away, you had to have something you fell away from. So we're living in the days when you can expect a lot of women. The Bible says they creep into houses and lead astray silly women. So don't be silly. Be sober. Why does Titus 2 say this is one thing that aged women should exhort younger wives, younger women, be sober. The young men to be sober. Be careful that you don't end up silly. You don't end up foolish where you end up being led astray. Led astray from your home. Into doctrines of devils and other Jesus and other gospels embrace abominations and in many cases fall into adultery and desert. So we might ask a question, what is a Christian? When I say desertion by Christian spouses, let's ask a question now and say, what is a Christian? What do we mean by a Christian? We might say overall a Christian is anybody that believes the gospel of grace. You know you're a sinner, you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins, and you know you're saved in eternity by his blood, not your works. However, in a more specific sense, the Bible uses the word Christian in a sense of not only believing the gospel, but having a public witness or confession, which is a large part of true discipleship. Notice 1 Peter, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. How did they get reproached for the name of Christ? Anybody know? They had to have some public witness that they were a Christian, right? Hey, there were some leaders rulers of the Jewish people. It said many believed upon him. The Holy Ghost said that. Don't you call that a fake belief? The Holy Ghost said they believed upon him, but they would not confess him. What does that mean? Public. Let's say should be put out of the synagogue, which means there were a lot of rulers still going to the synagogue that were not persecuted. They were not reproached. Why? Because they had no public confession. You say, well, nobody can be a true believer. Well, no, no, that's your wrong theology. You didn't get that from the Bible. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if anybody suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Hey, folks, I'm telling you, you got to be righteous to some degree. you got to have a public witness to be persecuted. So in one sense, a Christian is not only somebody that's saved in eternity because he believes the gospel, it's somebody willing to stand for Christ and have a public witness. You can keep your mouth shut and escape a lot of persecution. Hey, Peter warmed himself at the devil's fire. He denied Christ publicly. Tell me Peter wasn't saved in eternity? Got some strange theology out there today. What is a Christian? How does the Bible use the word? In Acts it says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. How did they know they were disciples? They must have had some public witness. It doesn't say they called themselves Christians. People called them Christians. You're, you're a follower of Jesus. How do they know? They must have had some public witness. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So the Lord himself makes a distinction between mere believers and those that continue in the word to show they are disciples indeed. Therefore, it is proper to make a distinction between mere believers in the gospel of grace and those willing to follow the Lord in discipleship. Now, way of the master, the whole lordship salvation thing, you know, there's a no... You're only a true believer, and you're only saved in eternity. If you are this sold-out disciple, I'd like to look in their house. I'd like to look at their wife. I'd like to look and say, let's see whether or not you're obeying God. How many abominations are you obeying? I mean, this, uh, 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 committing. 
God forbid, I hope none. But there's a lot of people out there that love lordship salvation and this, oh, you got to be dedicated. You got to be dedicated. Why does your wife have short hair? Why does she have short hair? Why your wife walking around in pants? Why don't you put on a dress? What kind of abominations are you committing, man, while you're walking around telling everybody else they're not saved unless they're a true sold-out disciple? Are you a true sold-out disciple? By your own words, you'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. You better be careful with this stuff, man. I'm telling you. Spurgeon liked to talk and flirt around with a lot of it. When he died, I tell you what, he said, I don't have any hope, any assurance, anything but the blood of Christ right now. I tell you what, you can brag about all that stuff about your discipleship and your works. It doesn't make good dying when you look back over your life. That's when you're going to want to be saved by grace and not your fruit. But that's a whole other thing. But it all relates here. Putting all of this together, you can be a believer in the gospel, but not necessarily walk as a Christian or a disciple indeed. The Lord tells you, this is a very clear-cut thing. He says in Luke 14, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, how many people compromise to get along with their wife? Adam did. Moses did. Hate means to love less in this context. Don't you love anybody more than the Lord Jesus? That's the point. You're telling me that every true believer loves Jesus and shows it practically more than any family member? You've got to be out of your mind. The way of the Master says, well, few are going to be saved. Saved in what context? You ever heard of the judgment seat of Christ and the kingdom of God, the thousand-year kingdom? A lot of these people have gone into post-millennialism and amillennialism. They wouldn't know the thousand-year kingdom. They won't know 300 years of Christianity that taught the thousand-year kingdom. See, he cannot be my disciple. His own life also. Unless you hate all of this, you cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Folks, if you believe that's every believer that's saved in eternity? No, I'm telling you, those are the ones that are going to say, the Lord's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. They're going to win the kingdom. They're going to die for it. They have fruit. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. That's rain. That's reward, people. That's not justification in eternity. There are carnal Christians. Oh, no, there can't be a carnal Christian. Well, I can't help you don't know how to read the Bible. The Corinthian church contained many carnal believers, whether you like it or not. Paul says, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Believers can walk like mere men, but you shouldn't walk in a practical sense like an unbeliever. You shouldn't do it. You should walk in a different way. That's what you should do. But what you should do, the ideal, is not always what happens. A lot of believers walk in the flesh. Paul says walk in the flesh. I mean walk in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh. My point is, it's possible to walk in the flesh, and you should not do it. So what of a professing believer, who may be in one sense a true believer, but yet they're full of unbelief in other areas, practical areas? The Bible says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. They ought to be trembling. They ought to have belief in the Lord's judgment seat of Christ. They ought to believe in the authority that God has ordained. But they don't. They say, I don't care about this church. I, I don't care about that. I'm going to go walk with the drunkards. Okay, well, we'll treat you as a heathen man and a publican then. That doesn't mean you're an enemy. It means we're going to pray for you. But you're not going to be in fellowship, see. And nobody else is to have fellowship with you. Not a believer. Not in a way that in any way justifies your sin or strengthens you and keeps you from repentance. God says a lot of my people would have repented had others not strengthened their hands. 
I and many others throughout history would argue that while some may indeed be fake, not real, there are true believers in the gospel of grace, but they're not true believers in the gospel of the kingdom, in the gospel concerning reward. So when Paul says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, for God hath called us to peace. In what sense does he mean? Does it mean a person who has never embraced Christ at all, doesn't even profess to be a believer? And even if you conclude by context that is obviously the case, then we still have a question. Can you make an application from these words to those that are practical unbelievers? Though they profess at least sometime in their life to have been a believer, they sure don't walk like they're a believer. Can you make an application to that? Our forefather says you can, and I believe they're right. If you're walking as mere men and walking as an unbeliever practically, if you're walking like a lost Gentile, the Bible says, This I say therefore, testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Obviously a believer can walk like other Gentiles walk. You can walk like an unbeliever. Even our Lord said in Mark 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that talking about eternity? Only? Merely? But he that believeth not shall be damned. I think sometimes when the Lord gives you the word saved, He means the whole package. He means saved, not only in eternity, but unto reward also. So I believe our Lord is saying that if you believe the gospel and will be a disciple, the first step of that public confession is baptism before men, which will get you in a lot of trouble in that day and age. Come out and confess me. You'll be saved. Meaning what? You'll get the well done at the judgment seat of Christ. You're not only saved in eternity, but you're saved into the coming millennial kingdom. That's the whole package. People say, I believe in the full gospel. Yeah, I do too. I believe the gospel in eternity and the gospel into the millennial kingdom. You'll see this also in Hebrews 3. Take heed, brethren. They're saved. So, well, these are Hebrews. Yes, yeah, saved Hebrews. Brethren. Just like saved Galatians, saved Corinthians. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So a believer can have an evil heart of unbelief. And departing from the living God. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They missed the, they missed the land of Canaan. They missed the promised land. Which is the kingdom of God when Jesus comes in the millennial kingdom. It's a picture of that. And in one sense, it's going to be the same area where God's temple and throne will be. Obviously, believers can fall into unbelief. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let us, therefore, labor to enter into that rest, the rest, the rest, the rest, the seventh day rest, the seventh millennium upon earth, the thousand-year kingdom, the world to come, says Paul, lest any man fall. If he falls, and obviously he has to have something to fall away from. After the same example of unbelief, I'm telling you believers can commit the sin of unbelief. That's why John tells us in at least the King James Bible, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Those that believe in regard to eternity need to also believe in regard to the coming kingdom of God. How do you do that? Well, in regard to eternity, you believe you're a sinner and you believe Jesus has paid the price for your sins and it's by faith alone that you're saved. But what you've got to believe in regard to the kingdom is you've got to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on His authority, on His power as your high priest to give you the strength to go obey the commandments, fight the good fight, overcome, so you may be crowned with glory and honor. You can obviously be an unbeliever in one sense and not an unbeliever in another sense. Let's notice one more argument here. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Why does he use that in a plural sense? In such cases? Might that not also mean it would apply to not just a mere unbeliever, but a practical unbeliever? In such cases, such example of unbelief? 
He knows how to use the word case in a singular sense. He says in Matthew, his disciples saying to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. The case, why not cases? Deuteronomy, and this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither that he may live. The Holy Spirit knows how to use the word case in a singular sense. It says in Psalms 144, happy is the people that is in such a case. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. Does it imply to just what that man did? Or to such a man, a man like that? Uh, Galatians says, envying murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And such like, meaning not just the murderers, not just the drunkards, not just the revelers, but other things as well. Wayne Gruden, who wrote a good book against feminism, says, I found several examples outside the Bible where this phrase clearly referred to more kinds of situations than the specific situation that the author was discussing. And he gives some examples of that in Philo and others. He says, Paul must have been persuaded that desertion by an unbeliever destroyed a marriage as much as adultery did. When he uses the broad category in such cases, he suggests that there are other situations that might also be included following the same line of reasoning. And one thing, you can make an application here, that when he uses such cases, he could refer to unbelievers that are nevertheless professing Christians, but they are walking like the world, walking like the world. Let me just close with some quotes out of history, and uh, we will close this part of our study on desertion. We'll rush through these, but I want you to get this in your mind, okay? Especially for those who may be listening and studying this out in a deeper way. A Catholic scholar, I, I quote him, Theodore Mekin, because uh, it's a good admission on his part. He says, Christian writers on the subject of adultery, divorce, and remarriage beginning in the middle of the second century and continuing to at least Augustine never call the following persons adulterers. A husband who remarries after dismissing an adulterous wife, a husband who remarries after being abandoned by his wife, or a woman who marries a man in either of these two cases. I think he's right about that. Luther tells us, jump all the way up to the Reformation, in 1523, Luther says, the apostle absolves and declares the husband or wife free where an unchristian husband or wife has departed or will not allow the other to live a Christian life. And he grants such a one the right and privilege to marry again. What Paul says here in regard to a heathen husband or wife is to be understood also in regard to a false Christian. Luther in 1523 says, the third case for divorce is that in which one of the parties deprives and avoids the other, uh, refusing to fulfill the conjugal duty or to live with the other person. For example, one finds many a stubborn wife who cares not a whit whether her husband falls into the sin of unchastity ten times over. First, the husband should admonish and warn his wife two or three times and let the situation be known to others so that her stubbornness become a matter of common knowledge and is rebuked before the congregation. His point here is if you have a husband or a wife that will not live as a husband or a wife, they have deserted their spouse. And after involving the church and rebuking and going through this whole thing, if they're living as a practical unbeliever, as a practical heathen, will not live in a practical marriage, they believe, the reformers believe, that you were free in that situation. Baptist Tindo, who was burned at the stake, which much of our Bible came from his translation, the King James Bible translator said they were perfecting what Tyndall gave us. Tyndall says, her sin adultery ought of no right to bind him. What if the man run from his wife and leave her desolate? After he's banished by magistrates, let the wife be free to marry where she will. If the woman depart causeless and will not be reconciled, though she commit none adultery, the man ought of right to be free to marry again. Desertion. Melanchthon, 1551, in the manner of divorce, the divine word frees the innocent person when the husband or wife has dissolved the bond of marriage by adultery, and it concedes to the innocent person when the case has been decided judicially the right to contract another marriage, the same is held in regard to a person who is unrighteously deserted. William Perkins says again, 1618, be it that the one is resolutely unwilling to dwell with the other, and thereupon flies away without any fault of the other. If the thing after a long space be sufficiently known beforehand, and all probable means have been used to reclaim the guilty person, after public and solemn declarations made, the minister upon such desertion may pronounce the marriage to be dissolved. For he that upon malice flieth away from his mate is to be holden in the same terms as with an unbeliever. 
who departs upon detestation of religion and the service of God. Somebody says, well, I left because of sin. Well, you should have brought that sin out. You should have brought that sin out publicly. Matthew 18, you should have followed God's word and followed it. But if you won't come forth public, go through God's channels. William Perkins says, suppose that a husband, which is an unbeliever or a heretic, in the found or a heretic, in the foundation of his own accord, upon de detestation of true religion, quite forsakes a believing wife and denies any more to dwell with her, what is to be done? The answer is relatively straightforward. All good means must be used to bring the infected party to repentance. And when none will succeed, but the case remaineth desperate, then marriage is dissolved on his part, and the believing wife is free to marry another. Westminster Confession of Faith, pretty much representing many of the Puritans and early reformers in 1646 says, in the case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out a divorce and after the divorce to marry another as if the offending party were dead. Nothing but adultery or such willful desertion as can no way be remedied by the church or civil magistrate is cause sufficient of a dissolving the bond of marriage. But they recognize willful desertion. Matthew Poole, we quoted last week, will be our last quote today, the husband's voluntary leaving his wife or the wife's voluntary leaving her husband. But the resolution to return no more to them breaks also the bond of marriage, frustrating it as to the ends for which God hath appointed it. And after all due means used to bring again the party departing to their duty, doth certainly free the correlate. Now we'll get this straight. This is not to be taken in the sense to where somebody can say, great, I'm not going to return to my spouse. Yippee, the marriage is over. No, you still got the sin of adultery. You still got the sin of covenant breaking upon your head. See, you're a covenant breaker. You're going to carry that to the judgment seat of Christ unless that sin is dealt with, repented of. You say, well, I told God I'm sorry. Oh, no, you got a lot more sorries to do. You got a lot more to do to get this thing forgiven. Confess your sin, make restitution, repent, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance then God will forgive it. But you better do that. You better do it quickly. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for your word as we study these sometimes compl complicated things, Father. But at the same time, Lord, help us in this day and age. Help marriages. Help spouses to stay faithful. For your sake, for testimony's sake, for any children's sake, whether their own or in the church. Let us not walk as an unbeliever. And if we've sinned, Lord, let us know that you offer an opportunity to repent, to somehow at least try to fix what we have done, to be broken and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. May anybody listening to this message today, if they've been a covenant breaker or an adulterer, they can go back to their former spouse and it's lawful to do so. May they repent and do so. If it's too late, Father, may they spend the rest of their life trying to fix what they have broken. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. All right, Church of God, thank you for